Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the AFR EMS Case Studies. My name is Chris Ortiz. I'm the EMS Chief for Albuquerque Fire Rescue. And today I'm joined by our Medical Director, Dr. Kim Pruitt. Hi, Chief. And we're also joined by Captain Robert LaPreece. Chief, thank you. Thanks for joining us. So typically when you come to talk about these cool calls, it's in your position as 7-8. However, this was an opportunity where you jumped on a truck. Uh, we're working Rescue 8 and responded to a 29 Delta. Uh, we ended up leading into a needle decompression. So we're going to talk about that case today. So thanks for joining us. So assigned to Rescue 8, yourself, Engine 8, heading to the report of a 29 Delta at Wantabo and Manal. Talk through some of your normal thought process when you're on a way to a call like this. Well, I think we just started reading notes to see if it was a motorcycle or a pedestrian, try to figure out what's going on there. We got there pretty quick, uh, so it was much pre-planning. Uh, I think Alarm said uh, APD was already on scene, asking for an ETA, that kind of stuff. So that's how it started. Okay. And then when you arrived, it sounds like you found an unhelmeted uh, motorcyclist who had had a high-speed frontal impact into another vehicle. That is true. Um, he was, on our arrival, it was in the middle of the intersection. The bike was completely destroyed. The gas tank was across the uh, intersection. Um, There's a big crowd of people. Uh, this kind of sounds kind of cliche, but there's a nurse on scene. The patient was ambulatory. He was standing with his head kind of drooping over he had probably a 70% scalp avulsion. The scalp was just hanging there. Uh, when we started, we got out of the trucks, we started to look at him, and already the nurse was yelling at us because uh, she wanted his head addressed, and we were lifting up his shirt at the time, trying to talk with him. Once we got his shirt lifted up, we could see wow. that uh, his right side and his right posterior side was all popcorn. It was, it was really bad. It was busted up really bad. Surprisingly enough, that patient that you just described was alert, right? He's talking to you. He was talking to us. He was grunting. He was air hunger. Um, he was panicked. He was grabbing and he wouldn't sit down. He was just that panicked. I thought he was going to run across the intersection. I could tell he's hypoxic. We couldn't get him to sit down. I got the guys to put a collar on him. We got a collar on him, and we tried a few attempts with our gurney to get him to sit. He wouldn't sit. He was yelling. He was grabbing. He was bloody. He was a really handful to manage. Um, I've never been, like, kind of this intimidated on a call in a while because he's not just a normal patient that's laying flat and maybe unresponsive that you can work with. Um, I knew he needed Versed. I told the guys, get him on the gurney in the truck now. We were in a level zero period. We weren't getting an ambulance. And I said, I don't care how you do it. Get him on the gurney. I'll meet you in the truck. I went to the truck. I drew up for said. Uh, thank gosh, these guys got him on the gurney. They rolled up, and we were able to load him. And that's like that phase of it. But right. it, it took, I think our total scene time on this call, and we'll talk more about it, was probably like, 10, 11 minutes, just because it took us five or six to even get him in the truck. Yeah, he was trying to get away from you, didn't want to be assessed, didn't want to be treated. He did not. He was grabbing. When he, when he got in the truck, I wanted some numbers because his chest was really uh, destroyed. Um, I had to almost barter with him. He wanted to put his feet on the floor, so we let him put his feet on the floor. He was grabbing the... Um, he was grabbing for the upper bar, completely drowning in midair, one of those. I told the guys, I need some numbers now, just minimum. I need a heart rate, a sat, all this stuff. I listened to his chest. His right side was absent. Numbers came back for tension criteria. He was satting, I think, 80. That's what was documented. Um, I don't know if we got an end title right then and there, but his heart rate was right around 130, 140-ish. He wouldn't sit still. Uh, I knew we had to. We knew uh, we had to decompress him. I got a needle ready. I had one guy hold his left arm, one guy hold his head, and with one hand I held his other arm up like this, 
and I just went right under his armpit hair, uh, did the decompression. Wow. Was the Versed already on board? Had you gotten that as soon as you got in the truck? Good question. As soon as he got in the truck, I was actually afraid to put a needle out. I think that was a mistake. Um, I think me and Kim talked about it. I did intranasal. Um, I wish it would have been a little faster, but the Versed didn't touch him. He got five, and then he got another five, and he was rowdy all the way to UNM. Back to the decompression. We did the decompression, <clears throat> a loud whistle. I've never heard a whistle like this that lasted, I put it at 45 seconds to a minute, and everyone heard it in the noise. Everyone was like, wow. The guy kind of grunted. He felt relief. <clears throat> Immediately, his numbers went up. Harvey went down a notch. His sat went up in the 90s, and we're like, great, let's go. We had a line prepped. Um, I had help on the way. I had a great crew. We were able to get an IV in him. Uh, we never did get a pelvic binder on him. And he was just too rowdy the whole way. Um, in route, he got a little more short of breath. He, you know, we had that initial improvement, and then he got kind of sicker. There was air moving in and out of that needle. I just left it alone. We just did high flow. Uh, we had him sitting up. We were talking to him, trying to get him to settle down, hoping this for said would kick in. A nice early report to UNM. Uh, <clears throat> at UNM, like five minutes post uh, turnover at the trauma room, he had a chest tube in. He was really quiet. And I asked the attending, what did you guys give him? Because we gave him 10 of her set. He told me, we didn't give him anything. We just did the chest tube. So that was his solace, like that saved him. We were able to do some patchwork on the way with the needle decompression, but he really needed a big bore in his chest. I'm sure Kim can talk about that. But um, that definitely bought him some time though. Ultimately, it did. he wouldn't have survived. No, he was. That he, transport. That's what made him scary is he was so active. He was fighting everything and he was dying in front of us and everyone knew it. It was really scary. And I'm not intimidated on many calls. I was, my ankles were shaking on this one. I'm not lying. Like it was really intimidating because I've never had a guy where we've had to fight with him so much to get something done to save him. So it was a pleasure. I had a great crew. I'm thankful. And um, gosh, what a great opportunity. That's yeah. great. And these trauma calls similar to this happen regularly. So I think a lot of the times we encounter a call like this, he was hit head on by a vehicle, extreme damage to the vehicle itself. Um, so automatically we're already thinking about that trauma, but he made a great point and he brought it up that he met tension criteria. So as opposed to just looking at the mechanism, we encounter this quite often. Doc, what do you want us to look for when it terms in terms of criteria? <laughs> I think this case has so many good learning points, and I'm so glad you called me about this one and we're getting a chance to talk about it. Um, I guess, first thing, these head injured patients that are concussed, and he clearly had a terrible head injury, they can be difficult, right? You know that they're critically injured and there may or may not be a substance on board in addition to a head injury that's making it hard to take care of them, right? And so I love the fact that you jumped to Versed right away. I think some people are hesitant in a head injury or a severely injured trauma patient to give that. And the truth is we need to, right? Um, in order to, one, facilitate the transport, two, facilitate their care, and it really helps the hospital because when he got there, they didn't have to give him anything. So um, you're setting up his entire course of his treatment um, by addressing that head injured combativeness right away. I think it was an excellent call to do that right out of the gate. Thanks. And then, yeah. and then once you get him under control and to where you can start to do your primary survey, the ABCs, right? He's clearly in severe respiratory distress. And that's what I think about in these tension patients is they're literally dying. They can't breathe. And it was like you described with the drowning, like his hands are up. He has to have his feet on the floor. He's trying to expand his chest because at some level. And I thought of you the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> All the credentialing we do, yeah. I thought of both of you guys. I was like. Oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening right now. These are folks, when, you, when you're when you thinking about doing a needle decompression 
you know, of course we want to base it on tension physiology. These are patients who are in obstructive shock. So we look for hypoxia, severe tachycardia, hypotension if you have time. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, look at your clinical picture. You had the right setting where you had multiple rib fractures, absent I think lung it was sounds. Ten, yeah. ten ribs. His entire, basically that entire side. And, um, they are hungry for air and they will sit up and they'll, they'll be agitated and they'll be gray and sweaty. And those are the patients where then, you know, you need to do it. Yeah. And, uh, I like your landmarks, the base of the armpit here, <sighs> there. Sometimes these folks, um, when they're having trouble breathing, the diaphragm comes higher than you would think, and it's easy to stick a needle. Because they're making their chest big, right? Yeah. They're expanding. Yeah, and that there's a <clears throat> spleen on one side and a liver on the other side, so you really want to go <clears throat> higher than you think you need to right at the base of that armpit here to decompress that chest just so you get it in the, in the right location and it's uh, effective. This patient got a chest tube. We talked about that definitively. That's what would helped him out when he got to the hospital. Um, but it's not a decision we should take lightly unless they meet all of that criteria. Tell us why on the other end, after we leave that patient, what that chest tube. Yeah, that chest so tube we does. actually look at these pretty closely. When you make that decision to stick a needle in somebody's chest, you just suck something into their chest wall. And if there wasn't a collapsed lung there before, there probably is now because there's a hole. And so uh, if it causes a big enough problem, this buys them a chest tube. And I don't know, I know you've seen chest tubes put in before, but it's a pretty barbaric procedure. It's pretty brutal. The tube, there's a tube about the size <coughs> of my finger that goes between the patient's ribs to reinflate the lung and to pull the air out of that chest cavity. But it typically stays there for two or three days until that lung reinflates. And with every breath, you're feeling that plastic tube rub on those ribs and it hurts and it buys them a hospital stay and so uh, for us to place that needle we need to place it when we need to but just just uh we also need to be sure that they need it and they're truly going to die without it um, before we do it because it can have some long-term consequences for them i like to always tell the guys that if a needle decompression requires a complete discussion they probably shouldn't be getting it it's fairly obvious when you have to do it and I think this case shows that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? This is a great example of that. The vital signs matched, the clinical picture matched, um, the mechanism of injury, his presentation, everything. It was an excellent decision. A long list of injuries that we got retrospectively um, to this patient. Ultimately, didn't have any pelvic injuries, but pretty much everything else <laughs> was injured. You did make mention, and I think it's fantastic when the coach puts on the gear and is able to do it just like you did there because normally you're coaching folks on these types of calls right you made mention of the pelvic binder you opted not to do it at the moment and then just in hindsight why do you tell crews that it's important to look for that pelvic binder and put that on you know the, any high mechanism blunt uh, trauma the pelvic binder is important because it can really save the patient from bleeding out I think our assessment skills have been proven and, and it's not just EMTs and paramedics, I think in medicine without x-rays, uh, the pelvis is pretty tight, the pelvic girdle, and it's hard to really tell if there's a fracture there. So the upside of the binder is it can actually save someone from bleeding out. You know, the downside of the, of the binder is zero. So if we're wrong, it doesn't matter. It's just a belt. Um, one of my calls I was on in the foothills in Albuquerque years ago when Drew was our medical director, uh, we had this guy and he, he had a long fall, he had a chest injury, and he had a pelvic fracture. We didn't have binders then. So there was all kinds of armchair uh, stuff going on, like why didn't you guys put a sheet on and all this stuff. Well, we were at 8,900 feet. There was no sheet. Anyways, that call got us pelvic binders. So what a great device for 20 or $30, Yeah, you know? Yeah. They really, there's a certain patient population where they're really important to think about the motorcycle crashes because the body of that motorcycle tends to oh, go yeah. right into the pelvis and then pedestrians who are hit by cars. Um, one nice thing you had going for you that I think your decision-making was still spot on, the fact that he was up and walking when you got there kind of tells you that his pelvis is probably intact. True. Um, so, but I still given, wanted to get given it done, the but mechanism, I yeah, yeah, if you didn't have time, it was motorcycles tend to have just devastating. And he was just so wiggly. Uh, we couldn't, 
Yeah. It was like we would have wasted time and oxygen putting that thing on him, yeah. and he didn't have that time. Yeah. I, I didn't. I was trying to uh, not make him fight. I was trying not to just force him on the gurney and make him panic and become more hypoxic. I was really trying to coach him on the gurney, yeah. and I thought I could. I left, and those guys did it. So I was really proud of everybody. They got him to the truck, and that's great. what we needed. That's mm -hmm. great. Because with a head injury, hypoxia is really the thing you want to avoid, and I'm glad you're paying close attention to that because it really helps helps that injured brain. Right. I mean, yeah, we could have jumped on him and restrained him, but then what oxygen was left after that? And then he's yeah. peri-arrest. Yeah. Then he codes in the intersection, and then we're, you know, it's trauma yeah. arrest. Yeah. So. Fantastic job. Thanks. Outstanding care by an outstanding provider. <laughs> and Absolutely. the crew uh, working alongside you. It sounds like everybody <clears throat> did a great job to, to save this person's life. The crew was amazing. Yeah, we had a, we had a good time and a great debrief, and uh, we got good follow-up by the ED. It was just outstanding. Yeah, it was a call I won't soon forget. Excellent. And I'll use this as an opportunity to let, remind everybody that UNM does offer the, the follow-up feedback on patients that we transport to UNM. So we have that QR code that uh, has been shared widely. If you need it, contact the 7-8. They'll be able to get it to you so we can get that good uh, 360 view of what happens after we leave that patient. The guys that have done, I think it's called Red Tab or Red? Red uh, Cap. Red Cap. The guys that have done it uh, are super positive about it. They always tell me, Cap, can you just believe the, the follow-up we got on the Red Cap? So it's out there, and guys are using it. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again for Thanks, coming Chief. to talk to the uh, Thanks, talk Kim. to us about the call. Yeah, um, and that's it for today's uh, session. If you have any interesting cases you would like to share, please use the SharePoint tab, um, or contact the seven eight, and we'll get you in here to record. Until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks.